Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is off. Tonight, the brothers at the centre of the WE controversy take the hot seat. This was not about the government helping WE Charity. WE Charity sought to help the government. Revelations from the tense testimony. Do I have to suspend this meeting? And where that leaves the Prime Minister. Three months after Canada's deadliest mass shooting, Ottawa agrees to a public inquiry. This process is going to give them confidence that uh, they will get the answers. Canada approves its first treatment for COVID-19. The bottom line is that the supply is not plentiful. So why is it so hard to get? It's all about getting ready for the weekend. It's hockey night in Canada like you've never seen it before. A little different without crowd noise and that sort of thing, but um, it was fun to be back out there. No fans, players tested and bubbled, but as baseball battles an outbreak, has the NHL done enough? This is The National. After weeks of questions, apologies and calls for resignation on Parliament Hill, today two central figures in the week controversy sat down to be grilled for hours by MPs. Mark and Craig Kielberger appeared before the House of Commons Finance Committee to answer questions about their relationship with the Prime Minister and his family and the agreement struck with the federal government to administer a multi-million dollar grant program. As Evan Dyer shows us, at times it got heated. Yes yeah, or no? We are not paid by yes any or one no. of those organizations. That wasn't my question. Yes Sir? or no? It was a contentious hearing that almost came to an early close. Mr. Polyev, do I have to suspend this meeting because I will? We Charity is a nonpartisan organization. The Kielbergers denied any kind of special relationship with the Trudeau government. I've never seen the Prime Minister or Sophie Gregoire Trudeau in a social setting. Neither of us have. We've never had a, a, you know, a meal with them. We, we've never socialized with them ever. And they denied they were seeking a bailout when they entered into the agreement to run the student grant program. This was not about the government helping We Charity. We Charity sought to help the government. Trudeau! Kielberg has also revealed they paid the Trudeau's travel expenses. Nearly 168000 for the PM's mother, Margaret. Nearly 20000 for his brother, Alexandre. And 25000 for his wife, Sophie. And that they only started paying Margaret Trudeau after her son became Prime Minister. The payments were a surprise to Michelle Douglas, who resigned as chair of WE's board in March. The information told to the board was that no speakers were paid to speak at WE Days. The Kielbergers said the money was not for the speeches themselves, but for other related events. Yes, she spoke on the WE Day stage, but she also provided time to come to the receptions, to have the opportunity to meet with individuals, to sign the books, to do all these additional events. The Kielbergers also denied they were looking for a shortcut to a lucrative government contract. Frankly, sir, you know, we understand what you're asking us, and we recognize that, frankly, I wish it wasn't a sole source contract. I wish we could have competed with others. I wish that different decisions had been made on the final decision making on all of these matters. That was not ours to decide. We did! And they said their deal with the government had put their whole charity's future at risk. Frankly, you know, there are days that we just we wish that we had never answered the phone on, on April 19th. Whether the brothers' testimony helped we charity or not, it did little for the government and instead raised more questions about why the Trudeaus were paid when so many other speakers were not and why we's own board of directors weren't informed of that. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, so let's bring Vashi Capello's host of Power and Politics into this conversation. Vashi, a whole very long day of testimony. In the end, though, how significant was it? Yeah, that's the question I've been asking myself all evening as well, Adrian. I'm not sure from a political perspective I have a conclusive answer. I, I don't think it was a slam dunk for the opposition. It's not like anything the Kielbergers said massively undermined the arguments the prime minister and his ministers have put forward so far. But on the other hand, here's where I do think it, it could be significant. We learned a lot today about the way the charity works and its finances, some major questions the government probably should have considered before handing over this student grant program to them. And we also learned that the money we paid to members of the prime minister's family for their work, except for one instance, was all paid since Justin Trudeau became prime minister. And that adds to the appearance of a conflict. My guess is, though the opposition didn't land a deafening blow, that will really fuel their fire going forward. Okay, so if we look ahead to Thursday, the prime minister, his chief of staff are set to testify. In particular, what are you watching for that day? 
Look, first, it's a big deal for the prime minister, any prime minister, to be grilled at a committee in the middle of a controversy. So that in and of itself is going to be a spectacle. Then I'm really going to be watching to see what approach the opposition takes, what they hone in on. Bottom line, will they be able to get the prime minister to admit something he hasn't already or reveal new information? It's a risky strategy for the prime minister to employ, to get grilled by MPs, like I said, in the middle of a controversy. It either pays off or it backfires. The stakes couldn't be higher. Adrian. All right, Vashi, thanks very much. Families of the victims of April's mass shooting in Nova Scotia are finally getting the full public inquiry they've been calling for instead of the review panel that had been planned. As Brett Ruskin explains, the federal government changed course today in the face of mounting pressure. The shootings three months ago brought people together to support the families affected. This week, they rallied for a different reason. Frank Wilton. Protests across the province to demand a public inquiry. Families want to know what the police knew about the gunman before the shooting, how officers responded throughout the 13-hour manhunt, and why the public alert system wasn't used to tell people that a gunman who looked like a police officer was on the loose. Dissatisfaction grew. Today, a group of Liberal MPs from Nova Scotia broke ranks with their own party and joined the calls to change the planned review into a public inquiry. This process is going to give them confidence that uh, they will get the answers they need. And it's finally going to be able to give us as a province the opportunity to get some closure collectively. Premier Stephen McNeil said today his government always did want an inquiry, but needed the federal government to get on board. A provincial inquiry would not get the answers required. We needed those five federal agencies to be at the table. And we're very pleased, uh, quite frankly, that the federal government is now going to do the inquiry. A public inquiry can summon witnesses and force them to give evidence under oath. Victims' families today are relieved. Darcy Dobson is the daughter of Heather O'Brien, one of the 22 victims. Everybody's very emotional. Um, this was not going to be easy, and we knew that from the beginning, but I'm glad that um, the government listened to what we want and what we need. And no matter how long it takes, this is, this is the right process to get the answers that we need. Compared to reviews, inquiries typically take longer to organize and execute. But it's what families wanted and what they've been calling for since that tragic weekend three months ago. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. New Brunswick, meanwhile, has confirmed a coroner's inquest will be held into the fatal shooting of an Indigenous man by the RCMP last month. Rodney Levi died after officers responded to a call about an unwanted person who had knives. RCMP say several attempts to use a taser were unsuccessful. The 48-year-old was shot. It is not clear yet when the inquest will happen. And yet another noose has been found at a Toronto construction site, this time at a light rail station. The company in charge of the site says it is disgusted by the hateful act. This is the fourth time in two months a noose has been found at a Toronto area construction site. And Toronto police say they have arrested a suspect in connection with a brazen 2018 playground shooting. Two sisters of five and nine-year-old suffered serious injuries, but they survived. Taquan Robertson evaded police for more than two years. He is now facing two counts of attempted murder. With most of Canada about to head into another long weekend, the country's COVID-19 curve is going the wrong way. It's going up. This is um, a worrisome sign. It is different depending on local jurisdiction. But, you know, the, the fate of the flattening of the curve is still within each of our hands. The national average has risen to 496 cases a day this week. Last week, it was 487. More cases across the West are bringing up that average. Canada's top doctor warns people need to keep taking precautions and that local officials may have to reinstitute, reinstitute restrictions to send the curve back down. Well, there is some good news, and that is that Canadian hospitals may soon have a new tool to fight COVID-19. Health Canada has approved remdesivir. That is the first treatment. But with the U.S. already having secured most of the world's supply, how much Canada is able to get remains a huge question. Christine Birak explains. Remdesivir won't protect anyone from COVID-19, but it can speed up a sick patient's recovery time. 
Health Canada says doctors can now give it to any severely ill patient who can no longer breathe on their own. I do think this drug will have effect against COVID and improve outcomes. Canadian clinical trials testing the drug are still ongoing, but Health Canada says it's reviewed existing data on remdesivir safety, efficacy and quality and decided the drug's benefits outweigh its risks for certain patients. There will be ongoing monitoring uh, of the drug in terms of its effectiveness and safety as well. Remdesivir was originally an Ebola treatment. It was meant to block the virus from making copies of itself inside our cells. Unfortunately, it didn't work. The virus kept spreading. But when COVID-19 patients were injected with the same drug, a large American study found, on average, it reduced hospital stays from 15 days to 11. Doctors say they'll take any help they can get. A lot of us are anticipating a fairly substantial surge in the fall and you'd like to have all your, um, your therapies ready for deployment. And yet, there's no guarantee that it will be ready. Remdesivir is now approved for use in Canada, but it's expensive and really hard to find. The U.S. government has bought up almost the entire global supply. I think the company will begin to accelerate its capacity, but um, the bottom line is that the supply is not plentiful. In an email, the drug maker said it expects to meet real-time demand in Canada and around the world in October. It's perhaps not the slam dunk we might have hoped for. Other treatments are in the works, but with fall just around the corner, the push for answers is relentless. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Canadians do have more than politics and the pandemic on their minds tonight. NHL hockey has finally returned. Something to celebrate in a year with so few reasons to cheer. Devin Haru has the sights, the sounds and the safety protocols of COVID-era hockey. And this is all about getting ready for the weekend. 138 days after the last puck drop. McKayev is with him in front and he scores. And it only took seconds. With dozens of newly installed cameras capturing every shot, save, and goal. A week of exhibition games in Toronto and Edmonton before it all starts for real on Saturday. I mean, it's going to be a challenge for everybody. I think that, um, you know, it's there's going to be rust and you have to understand that. Nearly 800 players and dozens of team staff are getting acclimatized, stepping inside their fancy bubbles for the first time. Daily testing, wearing masks and credentials, swapping dressing rooms, all part of the new normal. The NHL sparing no expense, decked out hotel floors complete with each team's colors, each bubble with 14 restaurants. Player safety, the number one concern. You can't let your guard down. There's no room for complacency. If that happens, certainly infection can be introduced and, and transmitted within the bubble. So far, so good, says the doctor. No new positive cases reported Monday after thousands of tests over the last week of the league's phase three. What do you make of the fact that the NHL is back today? Although these are all positive signs, uh, they still have to adhere to these public health guidelines and these public health restrictions in the bubble to make sure that if anyone does turn positive uh, that they don't transmit it to other people. 24 teams are in contention, six of them are Canadian and if everything goes according to plan, one team will hoist the cup in a journey that could run into October. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. So excitement aside, hockey fans cannot let their guard down over COVID-19. Here's Rafi Bujakanian on how Edmonton is striking the balance between safety and celebration. At sports bars across Edmonton, extra work to reassure people it's safe to take in the extra late playoff hockey season. We're asking people to do their best not to high five each other after a goal, not to run around and, 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 and you know, celebrate as much as they once would. We, we, we want people to come out and have fun, but we also want those same people to recognize that we are in a pandemic. The NHL, too, asking fans to curb their enthusiasm, but the support is still there. My head always only goes one way, baby. Go Leafs go, no matter where I'm at in the world. And if you think that's daring for someone in Oilers Nation, 
Yeah, I'll probably have a few beers tonight, enjoy the weather, watch the game. I mean, it's a battle of Alberta, right? And there's not too much going on right now. It's definitely nice to have something to do and creating a lot of buzz around the city. But how much of that buzz will translate into cash for the city? I don't think necessarily there's going to be any kind of economic windfall as a result of this. And the, the number of people that are involved and the amount of money that's going to be spent is just too small compared to the size of Edmonton's economy to really make any kind of impact. But Dan Mason says there could be future prospects for Edmonton. If you've got B-roll footage that you're showing of the River Valley and people biking and, and being active, and you're showing that uh, as you go to commercial, then certainly it becomes a way to market the city. But back in his bar, after months of forced shutdown due to the pandemic, Mo Blayways is hoping for a more short-term shot in the arm. We've taken every single precaution known to humanity possible at great expense and at great length for us, to be honest with you, um, to make you feel safe. So far, the league's bubble is holding, but among Edmonton's general population, the number is far higher than it was in mid-May when the economy reopened, with nearly 280 active COVID-19 cases. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. So hockey fans hope COVID-19 stays out. Baseball fans hope it stays contained. Today, Dr. Anthony Fauci was asked whether the Miami Marlins outbreak could kill the whole season. I don't believe they need to stop, but we just need to follow this and see what happens with other teams on a day-by-day -day basis. With at least 17 people in the Miami organization now testing positive, according to ESPN, the league has cleared the team's schedule until next week at least. The Marlins have remained in Philadelphia since Sunday's game against the Phillies. No one on that team has tested positive so far. The Toronto Blue Jays are scheduled to play the Phillies in Philadelphia on Friday. The financial impact of COVID-19 is so widespread across this country that every province is now considered a have-not province by the federal government. As Carolyn Dunn tells us, even Alberta is now getting more money from Ottawa than its taxpayers give. After being laid off three times, petroleum engineer Mark Taylor is using the CERB to reinvent himself. If I've got an application in to the RCMP, uh, hopefully that's the next, next stop in my career. Taylor's slice of pandemic federal assistance is part of hundreds of millions of emergency federal dollars flowing into Alberta in benefits, subsidies and loans. We asked economist Trevor Toome to crunch those numbers. For the first time in 55 years, it looks like the federal government is going to be spending a lot more in Alberta than they collect in revenue from Alberta taxpayers. Albertans typically pay more into Canada than they receive back. Before the 2014-2015 recession, it was about $20 billion more. But this year, COVID and low oil revenues have reversed that. Alberta is receiving about $22 billion more from the feds than Albertans have paid. Of course, federal COVID spending has turned every Canadian province into a have-not. But this new reality may not change long-standing complaints that Albertans are shouldering too much of the country's financial burden. So the fundamental issues about fairness in the Federation don't go away because of this, this strange, aberrant COVID year. Uh, we'll need to continue to address those. Some suggest spending all that money, even in Alberta, may actually make some Albertans more aggrieved. Albertans are going to have to pay all this money back for everybody else, not just the, the money that's being borrowed to send to Alberta, but the money that's being borrowed to be sent to Quebec, for example. Once Alberta is officially a have province again, of course. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. To the United States now, where the president doubled down today on his support for the use of hydroxychloroquine. Trump went on a tweeting spree overnight, promoting a viral video of a doctor who talked about the drug and some conspiracy theories. She's also made videos saying that doctors make medicine using DNA from aliens and that they're trying to create a vaccine to make you immune from becoming religious. Well, maybe it's the so, same, maybe it's not, but I, I, can't, I can tell you this. That. She was on air along with many other doctors. Uh, they were big fans of hydroxychloroquine, and I thought she was very impressive. The video was originally tweeted by Donald Trump Jr. Twitter took it down and temporarily restricted his account. Hydroxychloroquine has not been proven to be effective against the virus. The U.S. Attorney General testified today about the use of force by police 
after the killing of George Floyd and the protests that followed. As Katie Simpson tells us, Bill Barr defended the Trump administration's aggressive response. Shame on you, Mr. Barr. Can I just say, Mr. Shame on you. It was combative out of the gate. Democrats accusing the attorney general of doing political favors for the president. The president wants footage for his campaign ads, and you appear to be serving it up to him as ordered. This is what Democrats are talking about. Federal agents in Portland breaking up protests against racism and police brutality. Footage the president can use to promote his tough on crime re-election message. A show of force that's similar, they say, to the removal of peaceful protesters in front of the White House. When black people and people of color protest police brutality, systemic racism, and the president's very own lack of response to those critical issues, then you forcibly remove them with armed federal officers. Barr proved himself to be the ultimate ally, defending Trump's handling of racial unrest. Violent rioters and anarchists have hijacked legitimate protests. And he says the president keeps his distance. He's never asked me, directed me, pressured me to do anything in a criminal case. That includes Barr's decision to reduce a sentence for Trump's longtime friend Roger Stone and drop charges against his first national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Thank you for your service. I'm sorry for the abuse you've taken. Republicans came to Barr's defense through unusual means. Peaceful protesters. Peaceful protest. Peaceful protest. They showed an out-of-context video suggesting the media is downplaying the threat of protesters and accused Democrats of trying to settle scores. If they attack you, they've been attacking you every since, every day, every week for simply stating the truth that the Obama-Biden administration spied on the Trump campaign. Much of today was about political posturing, not necessarily fact-finding, which is not unusual given that the election is just a few months away. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. A bittersweet homecoming for the HMCS Fredericton after months at sea and a helicopter crash that killed six of its crew members. They came home with us, they came home in here. That's where they are. Next on The National, the emotional reunions and the return to life in a pandemic. Yay! We love you! Disturbing details from inside Johnny Depp's high-stakes court case. I was astonished that anyone would let Johnny Depp take this to trial. And she carried her dead calf for weeks while the world watched. Tonight, there's new hope for that orca. We've had the opportunity to identify two whales that are quite late stage in pregnancy. We're back in two minutes. Happiness tinged with a lot of sorrow today as HMCS Fredericton sailed into its home port of Halifax after a six-month Mediterranean mission. It lost six crew members in a helicopter crash three months ago in the Ionian Sea off the coast of Greece. And as Tom Murphy shows us, that tragedy, along with the new reality of the pandemic, was certainly on the minds of many on board and on shore. Navy ships have sailed from sailed back to this port for generations. We're really excited, right? But this time, it feels a little different. Yeah, it's definitely a different sentiment because there's the excitement, but then there's also that thought and that feeling of they're coming home, but not everyone's coming home. HMCS Fredericton returns nearly three months after a cyclone helicopter crash in the Ionian Sea claimed the lives of six crew members. The loss of this outstanding group of sailors and aviators was felt by every single one of us on board every day and has left a space in our hearts that were, will remain there for all of our days. The Navy, the Air Force, they've known loss before, for sure. But the mixed emotions of this day are so obvious. The joy and the tradition of the first hug the memory of those who didn't come home to the same embrace, their families observing from the dock. They came home with us, they came home in here. That's where they are. And consider this, this crew has pretty much been in its own bubble during its six month mission. There's been no home leave and plenty other restrictions because of COVID-19. There, oh, that's not him. Oh wait, yep, that's him. The masks can make recognizing your dad tough enough 
COVID precautions meant families couldn't reunite on a crowded dock in the usual way. Rather, the crew was bused to another location in order to walk to their families waiting by their cars. Life is very different. I've already been telling my husband, he's like, you got to come grocery shopping with me the first time I go. It's like, I will. It's like, follow the arrows, wear your mask. No one imagined a homecoming quite like this, but still, their home. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Up next, British Columbia's Great Otter Experiment. He's checking us out. He's looking right at us. The surprising impact 50 years after they returned to the West Coast. And 15 Emmy nominations for the final season of Schitt's Creek. We'll hear from the cast just ahead. Welcome back. A killer whale that captured the world's attention after grieving the loss of her newborn calf is believed to be pregnant again. That made folks aware of how important every calf is to the small population. Um, the whales, they know that. I mean, they, they, much like humans, they might only give birth to three, four, five calves in their lifetime. So every, every individual one counts. So you can see in these two pictures the change in shape between last year and now. In the summer of 2018, the very same whale sparked some serious concern after carrying her dead calf around for 17 days over 1,600 kilometers. Southern resident killer whales are endangered species in the Pacific Northwest. There are just 73 of them. Also off the coast of British Columbia, something remarkable is happening. Sea otters, once decimated by the fur trade, are making a comeback. 50 years after they were reintroduced to the area. But as Greg Rasmussen explains, their return is dramatically changing the whole underwater ecosystem. In search of the elusive sea otter, tough to spot in the waters near the northern tip of Vancouver Island. Usually out of these reefs we have otters. It's critical to find and count them to document their growing impact on the ecosystem. Yeah, there is one lying on his back. Right on. Oh, yeah, got Feet him. Feet up in the air. Once wiped out entirely in BC by the fur trade, they are now making a comeback. Now I see two more heads in there, a little closer to us, right in the kelp. One, two. So right now I see a female uh, with a pup, and the mom's just come up. She's giving her head a shake. Given their history as targets, they have good reason to be wary. They can smell us from here. They can probably hear the motor and the wind is blowing us right. So you can see their heads just trying to get away from us. Researcher Aaron Foster takes advantage of a calm day. I think it's just behind the rocks. To go ashore and count groups of otters called rafts. On this trip, we come across a growing colony of nearly 60 animals. They look like they're scared actually but sometimes the wind will blow the raft apart a little bit. Despite their cute and fuzzy looks, otters are a top predator, eating kilo after kilo of shellfish every day. Gooey duck clams, urchins, crabs, and other underwater creatures. So what am I looking at? Yeah, so I mean, my guess would be he's a territorial male. He's quite fat. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one's not so shy as a lot of them. And he's checking us out. He's looking right at us. He definitely knows we're here, and he looks very big and healthy. Their luxurious pelts made them a target for the fur trade starting in the 1700s. Once in the tens of thousands, they were wiped out, with the last known otter in B.C. shot in 1929. But their return wasn't by accident. Fifty years ago, Canadian biologists travelled to Alaska to capture and relocate enough otters to resurrect them on the B.C. coast. It turned out to be a giant experiment on the entire West Coast ecosystem. In 1970, a Coast Guard ship was converted to transport a large number of otters to the west coast of Vancouver Island. Sea otters were released in British Columbian waters. This may not have been home, but home was never like this. It's a remarkable conservation success, really, when you think about it. So sea otters were extirpated in British Columbia by the early 1900s. In the past 50 years, they've spread. From the 89 otters released, there are now more than 8,000 on the B.C. coast. 
Sea otters are unusual just because they have such a huge appetite and the change is, is so immediate and, and so direct. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's night and day. Vancouver Island University Professor Emeritus Jane Watson has been studying sea otters for more than 30 years and was one of the first to document their profound impact. No one was expecting it. When sea otters were reintroduced, no one knew that, that they were going to change ecosystems. What they also didn't know was how it would impact the multi-million dollar shellfish industry and the diets of many coastal indigenous people. We had big slam beach in Cayuga Ducks. That was the best slam beach that there ever was. 98-year-old Cayuga elder Hilda Hansen saw otters decimate clams, urchins, and other foods inside her community's traditional territory something documented in a Simon Fraser University research project. All what we eat was taken away by the cocoa. <laughs> Indigenous leaders hadn't been consulted, and scientists hadn't foreseen the impact of the otter's reintroduction on the food chain. But their return has an underwater upside. This is what's known as a sea urchin barren created when the urchin population explodes. Without otters to control them, urchins devoured once huge kelp forests. But now, with otters returning, scuba divers are seeing the kelp come back. Marine naturalist and scuba diver Jackie Hildering specializes in photographing kelp. The otters have done their work here. Like I went down thinking, oh, I'll be back in a few minutes with an urchin. And, and like ridiculously, all I could find is one urchin test of a green urchin. Once the urchins are eaten by the returning otters, kelp quickly grows back. It plays a vital role in the underwater web of life, sheltering all kinds of creatures, and kelp even sequesters large amounts of carbon, which helps combat climate change. All kinds of signs of reproduction happening down there, huge rose anemones. I ended up in a, a school of juvenile herring, so many juvenile rockfish, kelp greenling. While Indigenous people had little say in the return of the sea otters, they're now adapting to the changes they're bringing. All right, so where are we? We're at a place called Khumdaspe. So it means uh, the place of otter. And it's an old ancient village site. Mike Willie is a hereditary chief from Kingcom Inlet. And also owns a wilderness tour company. Boardwalk this whole place with uh, tent platforms. He's planning a high-end camping outpost for tourists, paying $1,000 a night. I'm excited about it. It's bringing a new economy, isn't it? Sea otter, sea otter viewing, it's bringing, uh, it's giving our First Nations a chance out here to take part in mainstream economy. He grew up on the water and sees a big difference between places that have sea otters and those that don't, such as his home community to the south. You see the change. It's different down there. There's uh, hardly any kelp forest down there, but there's lots of life up here. It's another world up here. And the balance that the otters will bring right, is, is yet to be seen. There's a couple tiny pups in this group. For thousands of years, this coast was home to both sea otters and people. The key now is finding a fresh balance. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Hope Island, BC. Up next, a disturbing glimpse inside a failed Hollywood romance. Johnny Depp's libel court case is now in the hands of a judge. We'll look at why this is such a big deal, win or lose. It is scandalous, sensational, and soon to be over. A UK court heard closing arguments today in actor Johnny Depp's libel suit against a British tabloid. As Renee Filipponi tells us, even if Depp wins, he may have a hard time polishing his tarnished reputation. Hey, we love you! It was a scene more fitting for a red carpet than the arrival at a court case that exposed disturbing details of Johnny Depp's marriage to Amber Heard. The actor is suing The Sun, a tabloid, over a 2018 article calling him a wife beater. I bet you scream before I do. The couple met on the set of The Rum Diary and were married in 2015. According to testimony, things became violent quickly. 
This image presented as evidence show bruises Heard says she got when Depp threw a phone at her. Over the years, she claims he abused her 14 times and she feared for her life. Depp testified he never hit her and that it's all an elaborate hoax. His former partner said he was never violent. Photos and videos shown in court paint him as an addict who would lose control and become violent. Depp's lawyers depicted her as the aggressor. I acted defensively in her life. Presenting a video deposition from their 2016 divorce, where she admitted punching Depp to protect her sister from him. I was astonished that anyone would let Johnny Depp take this to trial. This media lawyer says it was a risky move that made public troubling images and testimony from a volatile relationship. You know that you're going to get damaged. You just hope that the price you pay is worth it because the public want to know the fantasy. They don't want to know the gritty reality. And what we've had is three weeks of very gritty reality. Outside the courtroom today, Heard says she would have preferred not to be here. It has been incredibly painful to relive the breakup of my relationship, to have my motives, my truth questioned. Depp thanked his supporters. Some were even given handwritten notes from him. An unusual end to a libel case, which has been playing out in the court of public opinion. The judge will make his ruling in the coming weeks. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. The 2020 Primetime Emmy Award nominations were announced today in a more laid-back format than usual due to COVID restrictions. A big hit from Canada picking up several nods. Shit's Creek! Just one of 15 nods for the final season of the critically acclaimed comedy. You'll find comfort and safety at the partially renovated Rosebud Motel. With acting nominations for all four main characters, Catherine O'Hara, Eugene Levy, Annie Murphy and Dan Levy. O'Hara offered this message for fans, sad to see the end come. Thank you. Thank you to the kindest people in the world. And they weren't the only Canadians nominated. And now we have the nominees for Outstanding Lead Actress, Sandra O, oh, Killing Eve. Third time could be the charm for O, oh, who received Emmy nods for this role in 2018 and 2019. Well, Toronto-born Samantha Bee's Full Frontal is up for Best Variety Talk Series. The 72nd Primetime Emmy Awards are set for September 20th. Next, the show goes on in the face of COVID. It's like improvising, which is what jazz is all about. The, mystery of the, and life. the Toronto restaurant brings back live music with a bit of a twist. Their pandemic innovation next. Welcome back. Many live music venues have been forced to close down during the pandemic, silencing some musicians. But one of Canada's oldest jazz venues believes it has an innovative solution. Nick Purden shows us how the Senator in Toronto is using its balcony to stage street side concerts. All right, let's do a little bit of Corcovado. In C. One, two, three, four. This series is so amazing because it's a ray of light, you know, it's a, it's a positive burst of energy. This is a time when we all need to kind of figure out new ways of doing things. The meaning of existence. Oh. It was late March when the music stopped. Live music now banned because of COVID. So who's this guy then? Believing life was only. And how come he's singing? A bit of tragic joke. His name is Ori Dagan, and he's putting on a show here at the Senator Restaurant in Toronto. Oh, thank you very much. When the pandemic hit, Sybil Walker, the manager at the Senator, worried about survival. She wanted to make sure the place didn't fade away. Because some restaurants are going under and they're not going to make it, you know, and so they, this is just letting people know we're still here. We're not as we were before, but we're doing whatever we can. And they can't really do much. Nobody can eat inside, their menu has been slashed. But Sybil drew the line at music, because music is what the senator has always been about. 
we took a look at the balcony and thought, hmm, maybe that would work. It's 18 feet long, we're six feet apart, the musicians, we're 20 feet off the ground, so it's not part of the park's problem where you're too close to people. <laughs> so Sybil started the music again to keep the senator alive. It helps the musicians too. It's a payday when almost everything else has dried up. What does it mean to you to play music here during a pandemic? It is so incredible. I kind of liken it to an oasis in a desert because, you know, for months we haven't been able to play with one another. And, uh, you know, this is an innovation. It's an adaptation to uh, a negative situation. So I really, really love that. It's, it's kind of, to me, it's, it's like improvising, which is what jazz is all about. The mystery of the fate and life. Ori explains that there's something else music can do during the pandemic. It can help people get through it. I guess my, my biggest worry is just people giving up. You know, I hope that the, we, we all stick it through to the other side of this and uh, keep hope alive that there will be a time when we can all get together and uh, perform, keep the, keep the spirit of live music going. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Nathan Hiltz on the guitar and Alison Young on the saxophone. And we are serenading you from the Senator Balcony. Thank you for joining us. A serenade during a pandemic. I wonder what people think of that. I came down here to listen to some music, make you feel better, bring my spirits up, you know, make life better by hearing it live rather than just on my screen. Well, it's always healing, so in a pandemic, I think it's just way more essential than ever, really. It just keeps people together, it brings up the good vibes, and we have to support our businesses and our artists. It's essential. I think it's fun to go out. It's nice to get to hear it. Came I came here. for some lemonade and support the Senator restaurant and through what's a really tough pandemic times. I haven't heard live music since the pandemic started. No hearts are true. When you're performing and you look down and you see the people, what, what do you hope they, they feel? Joy. You know, uh, music is such a powerful uh, source of joy and I think we need that more than ever now. What I have noticed is that people respond to music more now than before. If the Senator restaurant can really provide that kind of hope for people, chances are it'll survive. Well, I can't do that. And Sybil thinks it could mean even more. I think that people really like to know that there are some things that they've, they've loved for years that aren't going to change. So I think that's comforting for people. Yeah, so when you hear it thunder, don't run under a tree. Places come and go, but this place has always been here, and it always will be. The bird is from heaven for you and me. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Thank you. And all right, next on The National, there is no such thing as perfect, except maybe for this student's grades. Her rare achievement is our moment. Next. Nomi Danzig always worked hard, but the Toronto student never imagined doing this well in school. She just graduated with an average of 100%. So that average comes from totaling the students' six highest grades, and Nomi had a perfect score in all of them. Her incredible achievement is, of course, our moment. It was kind of a disbelief almost. I knew I had good grades. I just didn't know that they were, you know, that good. The way they calculate the average is, like, your top six grades. So my top six grades were 100. I got a takeout with my parents last night, which was nice. That's... Uh, a big COVID celebration, I guess. A really big factor in getting good grades is time management. Um, just being able to know how much time uh, each piece of homework is going to take. There's not much else to do during the pandemic, so like learning is interesting, I guess, and that was a good thing to do to pass the time. She got 97 and something. Uh, 
It's like super disappointing. It's really nice to see hard work pay off, but also at the same time, it's just like, I don't know, like due to the whole pandemic situation, like a lot of kids weren't given the same opportunities to get good grades. Like I was super fortunate. I had like access to the internet, so maybe not all kids have that. So yeah, I feel like super fortunate too. Okay, she's amazing. Little, let's throw a little math into this. In the 10 years, Toronto District School Board has been recognizing top scholars. No one's achieved 100%. There were five students recognized from six schools, an average of 99%, a mark that has never appeared on one of my report cards. That is a national July 28th tonight.